it reminds me of something Dennis Prager, who's an Orthodox Jew and still practices the Sabbath. It reminds me of something he said. He said, my punishment for disobeying God's commandment about the Sabbath is that I don't get a Sabbath. And he's exactly right. And that's how a lot of God's commands work. Our punishment for not doing what God asked is that we don't get the benefit that came with doing what God asked. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. And welcome back, folks. Thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics. We got The Chaplain's Report coming up. And I wanted to address something that has been in the Bible for a long time. And I do have a pretty good understanding about it now, but it took me a while to get to this point, and it was something that I always thought was kind of bizarre, because I think culturally it doesn't really fit with our, our current culture, and so I'm going to try to do a little bit to bring this concept into the modern era. So the issue that I'm talking about, and it does relate to Christmas and the holiday season, and I'm going to get to that in a second, but... The thing that always bothered me is it seemed bizarre to me that God had to order people to take a day off. So for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, this is one of the commandments. So if you remember, if you go back into the old law, God actually commanded the children of Israel to have a Sabbath. And that's actually where the, the word for that day, the seventh day of the week, Saturday, uh, it originally derives from that Shabbat, which would be the, the Hebrew pronunciation of it, or the Sabbath. And the way that it worked is that God commanded the children of Israel, it's one of the Ten Commandments, that they had to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The book of Exodus and then the book of Leviticus goes into more detail on exactly what that looks like. And essentially what it boiled down to is you were not allowed to work on the seventh day. You worked on the other six days, and then you reserved the seventh day for a time of rest, a time for rest, not only for you, but for your livestock, for any slaves or servants that you had, for any working animals that you had. Everybody got a day of rest, whether they were a child of Israel or not. Even the people working in the land took that day off. And so God mandated a day off for everybody. And if you think about it, it's not that far removed from this society, but the reason I always thought it was bizarre is because I always liked days off and I actually really wanted to take days off. And it seems like the culture around us wants to have a lot of days off. I mean, for Pete's sake, we're talking about people now that are advocating for a legal mandate that companies are only allowed to work you four days a week, like 32 or 36. Hours. Yeah, I think it's 32 hours is one of the ones that they're arguing about. And so it may seem a little weird to us in our modern society, the idea that God had to mandate an actual day off on the seventh day that after you've worked for six days, you have to rest. Now, I do want to point out, I'm going to be focusing on the rest aspect of it, but it is important to keep in mind that the Sabbath day that was commanded always happened after the sixth day. And so God expected mankind to work for six days and then take the seventh day off. God wasn't a person that, that expected people to just, you know, put in 20, 30 hours a week and then be done with it. Now, if that's all your job demands of you and it's able to afford you a nice living, I mean, I guess that's all right if that's a decision that you want to make. Now, I would want to fill up the rest of that time doing something useful or productive, even if it's just volunteer work that I'm not getting paid for. I mean, you can be doing something good and righteous and productive without getting a paycheck for it. But my point in all of that is, there is an expectation from God that we are going to spend six days out of the week working and the seventh day will be rest. Now, I tend to work a five-day work week and that's fine, but my point is we're supposed to utilize our time wisely and then that seventh day was supposed to be reserved for everybody to sort of take a step back, to reset, and to meditate and focus on God and his law and also their relationship with their families as well. Because 
you have to keep in mind that this commandment came down at a time where starvation was an ever-present threat. And that's something that a lot of modern people don't really understand. Like even the people that are quote unquote poor among us are still some of the wealthiest people in all of human history. They still have an abundance of, of food, much more than people in past generations, especially poor people of past generations would have had access to. They still have access to a lot of amenities. There's the social safety net and a number of other things. And I'm not saying that they have no struggles or that their life is easy. I don't think that money determines the ease or virtue of a person's life to begin with. But what I am saying is even our poor people have a hard time going hungry. And so the idea that somebody would not be able to survive because they didn't work those six days is something that's a little bit foreign to us, honestly, in the modern society. But to them, this was an ever-present threat. And so because of that, you had a legitimate reason for being a little bit anxious about where your food was coming from and wanting to go out and work all seven days. You'll notice that one of the things Jesus does in his famous Sermon on the Mount is he talks a lot about this. He says, look at the lilies of the field. They neither labor nor toil. And yet even Solomon in all his glory was not arraigned in garments as uh, majestic as these. Therefore, maybe you shouldn't worry so much about what you're going to wear. And then talks about the birds and how God feeds them. And he says, essentially what it all boils down to is that if God is going to provide for you, then you don't have to worry about constantly working and trying to keep yourself alive for the entirety of your life. You can take time to take a step back. And so that really brings me to what the Sabbath was always really intended to do. There are several lessons we could learn from the Sabbath, but I think that the big ones are, first of all, your priorities. You see, especially men, I think that women have this too, but they tend to be a lot better about work and uh, personal life balance than men are, just generally speaking. Men especially struggle with this idea of, oh, well, I'm working for my family. I'm providing for my family. Yes, that is a good and virtuous thing. And most men have a desire to be that provider and protector. And that's that's a good thing. That's a instinct that God put into you. And it's good that you're using it for exactly that purpose. However, this is important. He does also want you to not just provide for the physical needs of your family, but be a leader for your family. And to do that, you kind of have to be there. And that's one of the things that the Sabbath was supposed to teach the men of Israel, that ultimately they had a responsibility to their family, not just to make sure that they had full bellies and a roof over their head. That's important too, don't get me wrong. But they also had a responsibility to teach their children, a la Deuteronomy 6, about God. That was their primary purpose, even more important than providing and protecting. They were supposed to teach their children about God, and they were supposed to have a relationship with their children. That's a blessing that God gave them and a relationship with their wife as well. Uh, likewise, wives are supposed to have that level of relationship with their children and their husband, and that's why the Sabbath was for them too. Uh, they weren't allowed to prepare elaborate meals or anything. You were actually supposed to cook all the food that you were going to eat over the Sabbath beforehand. And so the women got a day off too. It wasn't just the men. It wasn't just the day laborers. And so the entire community had a day where they all sat back and reset and were able to fellowship with their family, with their neighbors. They were able to take some time to focus on God. And so really, I think one of the main lessons we can take out of the Sabbath is priority you actually take time to recognize and to cultivate the relationships, which are really the purpose of you working in the first place. I mean, what good is working to provide for a family that you don't really know or that you don't really have a strong relationship with? You don't just want to be living in a house with a bunch of strangers. Another thing that it does, and I think that this is really important, is it's a reliance on God because like the children of Israel, when this was originally instituted back when they were out in the wilderness and God was providing for them through manna and through water, you have to keep in mind, these people weren't even like farming at this time. And so they were completely reliant upon God for everything that they had. And they just had to have faith that the manna was going to resume on Sunday when they gathered the double portion on Friday and gathered enough manna to be able to eat it on the Sabbath until, and, and that was going to be enough to get them through. But it didn't just go to that. That's something that continued when they did become farmers. I mean, famines were common in this time. You could have all of your cattle get sick and just die. This was a thing that happened and it was not all that uncommon. 
And yet you had to have enough faith in God that when he said, hey, take a break on the seventh day, take that time to be with your family and meditate upon me and the commands that I've given to you, you had to have faith that God was going to provide for you for that time. And it didn't just go to the Sabbaths of the every day of the week. You also had the feast where you weren't permitted to work. You also had the Sabbath years where every seventh year you just didn't work. And so it doesn't mean that you didn't do anything, but you didn't plow the fields, for example. You actually let the field rest and that kind of thing. And so uh, you had to have a lot of faith as an ancient person to do some of the things that God commanded. And then, of course, there's the 50-year Jubilee and all the other Sabbaths that take place. There's the New Moon Sabbath. And so there's all these different days that occur. And the children of Israel had to have complete faith in God's providential hand that he was going to be their protector and provider that they would not work on the seventh day. And so it establishes a faith in God that as long as you're doing the thing that God asked you to do, that he was also going to be there to protect you and to provide you the things that you weren't providing for yourself on that day. And then there was a third lesson, and I think that this one's really big too. It was gratitude. Because if you work really hard for six days, and you were able to see the, the fruits of your labor, you were able to partake of those, you are able to eat of them, it's really easy to think that you're the one doing the providing. And to an extent you are, and that's not a bad thing. But ultimately, you're supposed to remember that God is the one that's really providing stuff. Because is God providing the, the natural order that allows seeds to germinate and livestock to reproduce? Yes, he's doing all of those things. And you didn't matter how good a farmer you were, if God's not causing those things to take place, you're not going to be able to benefit off of that. And in the same way, God's the one that's sending the rain. God is the one that is uh, sending the sunshine. God is doing all of these things to allow you to be able to go out and make gain. God also made you and put the breath in your lungs. That's one of the things that the Torah teaches right off at the origin of man. And so it's important for us to think about these things because when you had to take a day off and not work, and the things that you were provided with, that you made provision for, were provided to you by God, and you had to take time and think about that, then you become a much more grateful person. And I really think that gratitude is the key to happiness, because then instead of thinking about how entitled you are and how there's a lot of things out there that you don't have that you think you deserve, instead, you become very grateful for the things that you've been given, and that makes you much uh, a much happier person, because you see yourself as a blessed person instead of a oppressed or set upon person by somebody else. It really changes the way that you view life. And so these are all extremely important things that the Sabbath taught us. Unfortunately, there were some people in the days of Jesus, and I'm sure that they were not the first. Other people, and in fact, we know from the Old Testament history, they are not the first people to misunderstand or misuse the Sabbath. But Jesus is on the Sabbath passing through a grain field, and the Pharisees have this conversation with him. We're going to go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. And it happened that he was talking about Jesus there. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples began to make their way along picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was indeed hungry and his companions became hungry? how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Go, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. One of the things that I think is extremely important about that story is, first of all, Jesus is not saying that what he was doing was breaking the Sabbath. A lot of people misread that story and think that that's what he's doing. He's saying, oh, yeah, well, I was breaking the Sabbath, but ultimately it's OK because I'm Lord of the Sabbath and I can do what I want. That's not actually what Jesus was saying. Now, did he have the authority to do that? Sure. But what he's actually saying is, do you people think I would break my own rules? Don't you understand that I'm the one that instituted this thing? And when he talks about it there, he's saying, ultimately, you don't understand the purpose of the Sabbath. You see, 
you guys would never say a crossword about David, who clearly violated God's law. But when David did that, he was doing so to keep his army going because his life was being pursued by King Saul. And so it's ultimately important to remember that God is doing things for our benefit. That's what he means when he says that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. See, it would be very, very bizarre if you got a Christmas gift this year for your one-year-old baby, and it turns out that the uh, it's a little baby onesie and it's a little too small. So what you do is you try to put your baby on a diet and a exercise regimen so he can fit into that onesie. You would never do that. That would be stupid. Why would it be stupid? Because the shirt was made for the baby, not the baby for the shirt. You're, you're reversing the order of importance here. And so that's what he was trying to explain to them. You guys keep using the Sabbath as a cudgel to bash people with. And the Pharisees were doing this over and over again. We see it multiple times in the Gospels. You see, they made a whole bunch of extra laws that God never instituted. And they referred to that as the tradition, which was, you know, the other side of the law of Moses. But it was the traditions of men. It wasn't something that God ever said. They, they had it to where you had to count a certain number of steps so that you made sure that you weren't doing too much work on the Sabbath and that you had to do this or had to do that. And they made a bunch of extra rules for the Sabbath. And they made it the most stressful day of the week, which is ironic because the whole point was that God was giving that to mankind as a kindness. It's not that God wanted to pass down these edicts through some arbitrary notion that he had that this was going to be what he wanted to do. He did it as a gift to mankind. It was God giving people that, and it reminds me of something Dennis Prager, who's an Orthodox Jew and still practices the Sabbath. It reminds me of something he said. He said, my punishment for disobeying God's commandment about the Sabbath is that I don't get a Sabbath. And he's exactly right. And that's how a lot of God's commands work. Our punishment for not doing what God asked is that we don't get the benefit that came with doing what God asked. That happens a lot. And that's exactly what happens with the Sabbath. This wasn't something that God put over people so that it could be a cloud over their head every week and that they'd have to walk on eggshells so that they made sure that they didn't uh, do any work. He did that as a way to say, hey, take this day unwind, spend it with your family, enjoy the things that I've provided for you. I'm going to be the one to provide those things. And in return, I also want you to think about your relationship with me and reflect on that for a little bit. See, the Sabbath was always intended as a gift. And as Christians, we're no longer called to adhere to the letter of the law when it comes to the law of Moses. We don't have to, to follow that anymore. The Sabbaths have been done away with. And I understand all of that. I, I get that. But the reason that I'm bringing this lesson up right now is because really that's what Christmas should be. You know, some people choose to celebrate Christmas as the birth of Christ. And I certainly don't think, you know, via Romans 14 that there's anything wrong with that. Some Christians choose not to. I think that that's perfectly fine too, as that verse says. Each esteems a day, you know, whether he esteems one day higher than the other or not, let him do so to the Lord. So either option, just go with your conscience and whatever, you know, you come to that conclusion is better for you spiritually than, than do that. That is an occasion where Paul explicitly gives some wiggle room and some freedom in Romans 14. But whether you do that or not, you do need to take this opportunity as a time to be with your family, to reflect to pray and be grateful and to take in all the lessons of the Sabbath. Think of this holiday season as a Sabbath. And I know that some people have to work over Christmas and I know that that sucks for y'all. And by the way, to our first responders and the people that are uh, keeping the lights on and keeping us all safe on Christmas that have to work on Christmas because of that, the soldiers that are overseas, people that are doing public service on the holidays. God bless you, and, and I appreciate your service. I really do, because that allows all of us to have a Sabbath, because you guys are out there making sure that we're safe. And so, you know, whether you work in utilities or, uh, like I said, a, a police officer or a fireman or paramedics or people working in the hospitals, I know nurses that have to work through the holidays, but whatever you're doing in that capacity, 
we certainly appreciate that. And I would like to extend a personal thank you for that. But for everybody that actually does get this time off, this is a really great time to take a step back, to be with your entire family because so many people are off work and to be able to fellowship with them and reconnect with them and more importantly with God. Strengthen your relationship with one another so that it can help aid in strengthening your relationship to God. That's what the Sabbath was always intended to do. And so treat this festival that we celebrate as a Sabbath. And I think that there's a lot of good that we can learn from that. When you're thinking about the presents that you've been given or the Christmas dinner that you're about to enjoy or just being around your family, be thankful for that because there's a lot of people that don't have that. And I just wanted everybody to really think about that and to take this opportunity. Maybe we should take some lessons from the Sabbath and apply some of those lessons and those teachings and some of the wisdom that God gave the Israelites and apply them to times where we get a chance to take a breather and take a break from our busy lives and really just get to enjoy that time with our family and our God. You know, I remember Gad Sad said that there are four ingredients for happiness. Work is one of them, and so that's kind of the opposite of what we're talking about now, but he does say, you know, a Sabbath is only a rest. You only get to rest if you worked. If you didn't work, you're not really resting. And then the other three, he said, were friends, family, and God. And if you do all four of those things on a regular basis, you will be happy pretty much no matter what. And he's probably right. So, you know, as we're going through this holiday season, however you celebrate the season, think of it as a Sabbath and just take that time to really enjoy it. Reconnect with God, re read some Bible together, do a devotional together, find ways to really connect with one another and, and do so with the explicit purpose of trying to better not only your relationship with God, but those of everybody around you as well. Enjoy this season. Merry Christmas. Happy Festivus for the rest of us, of course. And until next time, stay the course, friends. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me, I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.